Hello and welcome to Read Becca. Hope you guys are having a great weekend so far. Uh, it's very hot and gross here, so I'm gonna jump on the bandwagon of talking about weather. I think everyone is dealing with a lot of heat, particularly the West Coast is getting unusual heat that they're not prepared for. Uh, we had a lovely week. <laughs> so we got storms last weekend that cooled the temperatures way, way down, and that was really fantastic. Um, so it dropped literally like 15 degrees in an hour. And uh, then we had several days where it was glorious weather, mid 70s and a little breezy. So I was able to get outside a lot and really enjoy the outdoors. And now Friday, we got storms in the afternoon, uh, which was yesterday, and temperatures started warming up. And because of the storms, it's super duper humid. So it's real gross outside. Uh, we now have in the forecast for the next week solid scattered thunderstorms. So we're gonna get some just really nasty, terrible weather for the next week. Um, and I, I will insert a couple clips of our, our weather this past week so you can kind of see the opposite sides that we saw uh, of our weather. We get pretty extreme storms, so I'm in part of the Midwest uh, where, you know, we get tornadoes and whatnot. So um, I'm used to this. It's very, very typical, but usually it's in spring rather than summer. So this is a little bit out of the ordinary to have just a solid week of storms. So uh, as far as my actual week, I didn't do too much. Um, I think kind of last Sunday, I hit a wall big time with reading. I got done the couple things that I had mentioned. So I did finish before the ever after uh, in the morning on Sunday and I had finished How to Find a Princess the night before. So those are both done. Um, and, but then it was just like Sunday all day. My energy was super low. Uh, and I just did not feel like reading at all. So I didn't get too terribly much done. I mean, for me, it's, I still read a lot. I always read a lot, but it just wasn't as much as I expected to. And I mean, I still am reading an insane amount this month. I checked my numbers and already I am, uh, in line with one of my best months last year, which was much higher than what I've been doing this year. I'm more than a thousand pages above any month this year. So, and that's not even counting the many things I have in progress right now that I've read several hundred pages on. So, um, but after that, you know, <laughs> Ripley, Ripley just jumped off of a, uh, a scratching post, scared herself. Are you gonna come over? Are you gonna assist? Okay. Um, so, uh, what was I saying? Oh, right. So it was very up and down. So being able to go outside was really nice and that I was starting to feel much better, um, and like really getting back into reading. And then, um, Friday afternoon and evening, uh, my foster cat took a really bad turn again. And, you know, it was, it was like, he's been at the point where, um, since he was at the vet last time, he was doing really good and we were dealing with things with his new medication and that was helping, but then he has started kind of puking every two or three days, but it was like one and done type situation where his appetite was staying up and he would basically just, you know, puke and then want to eat immediately after. Uh, so he was feeling better, it seemed like. Um, but then this, this was... Um, like Friday night, it was like just puking constantly and he thought he wanted to eat and then literally I would feed him in the kitchen and he would not even make it out of the kitchen and just throw everything. Out. So I think unfortunately, you know, we're, we're headed into or are into the final stage. Um, and he should be due for the vet as long as he doesn't have any, uh, emergency situations to so check his blood work again early next month. So it's, it's very sad. Unfortunately, you know, he's, he's going to be here till the end of his life and that will probably be sometime soon. So it's hard, very emotional. So I didn't really want to do any reading last night. I, I really, really didn't uh, do any and just kind of vegged out and cuddled with him and stuff. And he's feeling quite a bit better today. So that is great news. Um, 
So I have gotten quite a bit of reading done this morning. <laughs> so um, now that Ripley is here on my lap, because she loves to be the center of attention, um, I don't know how I'm going to hold books. <laughs> so uh, we will try this though. So um, I finished up uh, number one is Rape a Crime by Michelle Bodler. And it's impossible to not get glare on this one. Uh, so this is told in three sections, um, but really, I mean, the first section is labeled a memoir, but I think it is really a memoir the whole way through. Um, it looks at starting in the first section, her experience immediately after her rape. And it does not get back to the actual account of her rape until the very last chapter of that section. So obviously fair warning triggers across the board for this, but there is not a lot of descriptive accounts of the rape other than that one chapter. Uh, so the first section really goes into how destabilizing of her entire life the situation was and how um, difficult it was for her to get any um, information or be given any information and how little she wanted to pursue that information. She just didn't have the energy or the emotional fortitude to do that on her own and it wasn't really her responsibility. And then the second section, she is finally pulling things back together and stabilizing her life um, after this massive trauma. So she's had struggles with a career for a long time and the refocusing thing moves her towards um, academics and actually specializing in this topic. Uh, so she winds up working with a lot of victims groups and kind of being an ag advocate mostly. And so the second section, the investigation, really is spurred on by that, number one. And then number two, just a random news story that she sees, which I remember the time that this story was kind of breaking and blowing up, um, is the rape kit backlogs in many crime labs across the country. So that really was the incitement of her journey of investigating about the rape kits, finding out about her own rape kit and the outcome of it, because she had never really followed up and found out exactly what happened with the investigation. So that section really is very much her discovering what the system looks like and how it treats the victims. Um, and there's a lot of injustice and it will make you very mad. Uh, then the final section is the manifesto. And the manifesto talks about how much the system has um, not progressed in measurable ways. Uh, not significantly, how it still treats the victims as someone to investigate their character first before the criminal. Um, the fact that victims going through a rape kit still does not necessarily mean it's even going to be used because detectives get to decide whether or not they're even going to investigate. Um, so I think that was all really harrowing to read and infuriating. Um, the one main thing that I learned out of this, I, I knew a lot of the basics before, um, but she talks about things like special victims units and special crime units and um, discusses the fact that a lot of times they don't have measurable targets. Uh, they don't have statistics that you can look at and say they've actually made a dif difference. And many times um, they don't have standards about how they're meant to operate. So they can be simply a PR move by a department when there is a problem going on in the city to sate the angry citizens basically, or, or calm the fears of the citizens while not actually having a measurable effect. In the case that she was focused on um, in her city, there was basically an increase in the types of crimes that this special victims unit was established for while they were operating. And yet their budget was consistently cut. Um, they obviously, since it was an increase, they didn't show a measurable impact. So, you know, what was the point? It was, it was really all this motive, 
this propaganda motivation. You know, things are getting better in our ability to speak out um, and, you know, speak to people in position of power who are committing these crimes, but the response from a legal perspective is not really getting too much better. And um, so, so that is just awful to read. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, it talks about very much how these people in positions of power are still viewed as victims of this and that, you know, their lives are being destroyed. Um, so, you know, it is very much always this, the victims of rape are somehow at fault. Um, so I just want to read one little line, and this is toward the very, very end of the memoir section after she has actually recounted her story to the woman who will later become her wife. Um, and I think this just encapsulates the the point of this book so well and the tone of it. It's just righteous fury, really. Why would it be my job to make them do their job, I thought. We settled into silence. I thought about my alcoholic stepfather and how I'd hint for a week about my birthday coming up so he'd remember to buy a card. It wasn't the card I wanted. It was to help him so he wouldn't be embarrassed he forgot. Mary, I can't and I don't want to, I finally replied. The last thing I want to get involved in is being with men who haven't done what they're supposed to do on my behalf and have their disappointment in themselves boomerang back to me. So she's talking there about basically her lack of follow-up on her case, um, you know, and her saying it wasn't my job. I was doing everything I could to keep myself together and continue my life, and it wasn't my job to make sure my case got handled. Um, it was the men who were investigating it, and they said they would, and, you know, they n didn't necessarily live up to that. So I thought this was really fantastic. Um, I think if you can handle the content, this is definitely a, a must read. And then the next thing I finished was, in fact, a picture book. So I picked up We Wait for the Sun by W. Johnson Roundtree and Kate McCabe with Risa Figueroa. Yeah, Risa, Risa Figueroa. Um, so I picked this up because I'm a nerd and uh, having just read the Lady Astronaut novel, um, I was looking into kind of related things and found out that uh, W. Johnson Roundtree was a, a WAC uh, in the Women's Army Corps, and she was one of 40 Black women who were in the Women's Army Corps, which was 150,000 uh, American women in World War II. And so this is not about that at all. This is just purely a sweet story with beautiful illustrations, really just a gorgeous book about a little girl picking berries in the morning before sunrise with her grandmother. And that's all it is. But uh, at the back, it does have a section about her um, her history and from, pulling from her biography, um, Mighty Justice, I think. Um, and so, so this section is all about her biography. So I may pick up that the actual biography. Um, and here, here is her in the Army Corps. So I like this little couple page bio in here. And um, so it just seemed very interesting to me. And I think this was a really sweet little story. So that is all I finished this week. So I've got a ton of stuff on the go, as I said. Um, so for Translate-a-thon, I am still reading Autobiography of a Corpse um, by Sigmund Krasanzowski. And I will probably wrap this up much longer in my Translate-a-thon wrap up, but I only have, to, I've read it completely out of order, so it looks like I'm in the middle, but um, I've only got two very short stories left that are like less than 10 pages. So um, I'll fly those through those this weekend. I have liked this overall, but I think I liked the longer stories much, much less. They were very, very abstract and kind of didn't really seem to have a point. Um, I think actually my favorite story was the first one I read, 30 Pieces of Silver, which was all about Judas's coins and kind of how they were cursed and what they went on to do after him. Um, and then the second favorite, I think, was The Unbitten Elbow, <laughs> which is all about a man who is trying to bite his elbow. 
and he kind of becomes a uh, a sideshow freak basically for a carnival and that ga gathers enough attention that um, he spawns almost like a religion where there are people who are pro-elbowist and anti-elbowist and there are people who think he's going to be able to bite his elbow and people who don't and there's a lottery <laughs> it's very there's a whole mythos around him basically um but it's it's kind of a very dark story in the end um but i liked i liked uh the ideas and the the thought of um pursuit of futility really i think is what that was really about so overall it was a mixed bag i think it was okay i really enjoyed a couple of the stories uh, next, I have on my Kindle, and I'm a little over halfway done with Chaos on Catnet by Naomi Kritzer. I'm really liking this. I think it's more polished than the first book in the Catnet series, but I think it lacks a little bit of the charm that I loved in the first one, and it's got less of the clouder. So, I don't know, I'm not loving it quite as much. It does have a really interesting cult element. So the um, there is a new character introduced, Nell, who came from a very conservative religion and she is very sure it's not a cult, <laughs> but it, it's really a cult. Um, and then it also incorporates uh, conversion camps. So big morning for that. Uh, then I picked up my physical copy that I got on hold of dress codes and uh, this one I am maybe halfway through and here I'm 170 pages and this has it has mostly black and white pictures so I was hoping there would be more just as you can see these are the Zoot Suit Rioters <laughs> um, so very interesting to see the pictures but there are some color pictures in here here we go all right so here are the color pictures there's two sections of color pictures Joan of Arc um, Um, oh, this is interesting. Hang on. So I must, I don't think I've gotten to the section about this, but these are crinoline fires. And it says crinoline fires killed and injured thousands during the style's heyday. So hang on because I have another book. So I can't believe that. Um, so yeah, there's a whole section in this book, Ballerina by Deidre Kelly. Um, and this is my own book. Uh, which talks all about the mistreatment of ballerinas uh, over the entire history of women being dancers. And at the very beginning, they had candelabras lighting the stages and ballerinas were constantly catching fire. And so this is exactly the same thing. Very interesting. Very curious. Very, very curious. So anyway, I will be continuing on with reading this. I'm, like I said, halfway through. Uh, I really enjoyed it, so I'm looking forward to getting back into that. I am reading Master of Poisons by Andrea Hairston, and I am a third of the way through. I just finished part one, and I'm liking this. Um, it is kind of big epic fantasy, though, and it's very one tone, so very dramatic all the time. Um, I, I tend to not like big epic fantasy for exactly the reasons that I'm having issues with this is that uh, our main character here and you can barely tell but there's bees these are bees and I never noticed that until I had the physical copy but uh, she is a garden sprite with bees in her hair and I I literally just want to read about the lives of the garden sprites <laughs> I don't care about the rest of this book and none of that is in here so we basically get told that and then there's nothing it's you know, just she's act, she acts like a, a normal woman. So, so the focus is not where I want it to be. I really want to explore other things than what the novel wants to explore. So, but I'm enjoying it in general. Then I have the shadow of the wind. So I am not very far. I think I've read two chapters and that's it. So this is a priority for this weekend because that is also for a translated thon. So that is all my in progress stuff. Um, I had not gotten into Shadow of the Wind as much as I would have liked because, like I kind of explained, my week ended up being a little bit more challenging than I had expected. So we're going to do my mini July TBR slash what's upcoming. 
I have a still a shed load of books from the library that I have talked about before. So my TBR is almost entirely going to be the library books I've got checked out. I have no more holds, um, not because I canceled them, but because I actually got in all the holds that I, I had. Um, so, oh, I actually did start. <laughs> I started the one hold I had. Um, so I started on audio, You Look Like a Thing and I Love You by Janelle Shane, I think is the author. So that was one I had on my wish list. And then Shannon from That's So Poe read it and really liked it. So I put a hold on it and it just finally came in and after several weeks. So I started it really enjoying it so far. It is all about, uh, it's nonfiction and it's about AI and the weirdness of AI. So what we've got from the library that I have already shown you is Quality Land. This one I want to make some good progress on this weekend. I have not started it yet. We've got uh, Before She Sleeps by Bina Shaw. And we've got um, Drive the Plow Over the Bones of the Dead by Olga Tkarczyk. And I've got Pew by Catherine Lacey. So that's all the library stuff that I have not even started yet. Uh, then we are still working on the Le Guin project. So volume one, I only have short stories left. Um, so I've got this much remaining. I've got about 100 pages of short stories and then a couple of the introductions to read. Uh, so I want to finish that up this month and then right above my head over here, you can see is the box set. So there's a whole nother omnibus. And I think a uh, word for world is forest is the next one that I have to read. Pretty sure. So that's going to be most of my TBR for July. But, but we did the booktube spin and my July TBR has added two books from the booktube spin because Rick decided to do a double surprise. Not only were we a month early, but he wound up deciding because we've got three months to read these, he spun for two times. So number one was number two. <laughs> the first the first pick was number two and for me that was Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom by Cory Doctorow. This is a future sci-fi and it's I don't know, dystopia or utopia. Um, he tends toward more utopian type stuff but people are living and continuing to run Disney World. <laughs> So, um, so this is from the perspective of a guy who has um, lived a very long time. I, I'm not sure if they're immortal or people have just kind of fi figured out anti-aging stuff sufficiently that they live a very long time. Um, so I think there is going to be a conflict over the people running the Magic Kingdom. And that's what this is about. And then the other one is number 20 was from The Shadows of the Alpine's Court by Benedict Patrick. And this is the fourth Yarns World novel. Um, this is the second in the, I, I don't know which, what sub-series it is, but the first book, they mostly come out at night, is the previous book in this series. Um, so this is kind of traditional but the story of the first one was almost like the village like everybody has to hide at night because there's these monsters that come out and the premise of this series is really wonderful where um, each book is kind of set in a different type of like a different region of the world um, this one is more traditional but in between the chapters there is folklore from each different region of that world uh, so you get a little fairy tale folk tale in between. And um, I liked the first one because some of that kind of folklore and parts of the story really mind reminded me of the creepy vibes of Studio Ghibli films. Um, so like Spirited Away in parts uh, gets really that creepy whimsical and I think this captures a little bit of that vibe. So I'm very much looking forward to that. I want to finish that series, all of the books available this year. So I think that is all the books. I think we're done. Um, so in other stuff, random stuff, um, what else did I do? Watching, I 
I did actually completely watch all of Sweet Tooth, the new Netflix adaptation, and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was very well made, and um, the trailers definitely made it seem real whimsical and heartwarming, and there was a lot of backlash about that from the comic book fans. And it manages to do both things that it's very graphic and violent, but it also is really whimsical and heartwarming as well. Um, so I think it was very compelling and beautifully told. But there was one major problem for me that I couldn't stand is how, just how much Sweet Tooth was like too dumb to live trope, basically. Like, kid every time could not sit still, could not hide, could not be quiet. It was so frustrating. Um, so I nearly quit multiple times. And I think it's a fantastic show. It's really well made. But just the pervasiveness of that being a constant for the entire series, like every single episode, something happens with him that's like that. It was so frustrating. I hate that. It's like that and secondhand embarrassment, I think, are things that just get really under my skin. Um, so that was my TV watching. As far as other stuff watching, there was a really, really great, pa uh, not panel, <laughs> conversation on the World Builders Twitch um, with Malka Older. And it was all about um, like a speculative resistance, I think is what they called it. Um, so it was an interesting conversation, but they had some pretty severe technical difficulties. So they lost her for like an hour or half an hour. And, uh, and then there were like disruptions. So I think the conversation kind of got stunted a little bit because of that. Um, but, but through that, I was pointed to uh, another thing that she has done recently, and that is the Sparkle Salons. <laughs> so um, apparently Arizona State University, their science department, somehow is, is working with Malka to host these panel discussions. Um, which are made up of uh, Malka, uh, Karen Lord, Amal El Motar, Arkady Martin, um, who else? I'm forgetting someone. Annalie Newitz and Katie Beck. And all of those people are speculative fiction authors, obviously. I think you will probably know all of them. Uh, Katie Beck, I think, is a more recent author. Um, but they also, in addition to being authors, have very specialist careers. Um, so, and that's why the science department is kind of hosting this. So they had like an hour long conversation and didn't even get to the spec fix stuff, but it was so ridiculously interesting. Um, they started, like the jumping off point was them talking about uh, the ash that is currently going over to the Caribbean and wildfires. So they jumped into wildfires. They jumped from there into land management. And Arcady Martin works for the government basically and was talking about how uh, the New Mexico Land Bureau effectively still works on a combination of the, the current laws with um, grandfathered in Spanish law system and like they talked about all of that. They talked about like reaching your government. They just went all over the place. And so if you enjoy hearing really smart people talk about the thing that they are invested in, it, it was wonderful. It was probably one of the best conversations that I've ever been able to listen to. So I'm, I will link both of those things down below, both Malka's discussion with uh, world builders and the Sparkle Salons. But it sounds like it's going to be an ongoing series, the Sparkle Salons is. So it's something I definitely will be following. I, I really enjoyed it. I love those kind of conversations with people who are just really smart nerds who like nerding out about these things in a highly intelligent way. So I think that's it for me today. Hopefully, hopefully I didn't ramble too much. I think I did. Probably gonna have to cut this. I was so committed to not editing my, uh, my weekly updates, but I think this is gonna be, we're at 40 minutes right now. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not going to leave 40 minutes of this in there. So, um, yeah. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I will 
show you some weather footage after this. Um, hope you have a wonderful weekend. Cinnamon got a haircut this week. He's feeling frisky. Weather cooled down and it's very nice out. Geese are out on the pond. It's just a beautiful day.